Hello guys. In this video I'm going to be building this Lotus 102B from Tamiya with the box lid that for some reason I filmed upside down. I picked this kit out of my stash recently because I thought it'd be a relatively quick build being a, a mostly white car and with the green areas being decals. That didn't quite turn out to be the case but nevertheless it was quite an enjoyable build. Now these Tamiya F1 kits are quite similar in their uh, construction process and techniques. So I'll tell you a little bit about the history of the Lotus 102 while I continue building it. So the 102 was Lotus's entry originally for the 1990 Formula 1 season using a Lamborghini engine. And it was updated to the 102B using the Judd engine for the 1991 season, which is the kit that I'm building here. This kit was originally tooled by Tamiya in 1992, and as far as I know it hasn't been re-released since. So when I saw it on sale on eBay a while ago, I snapped it up. For 1991, the first driver for Lotus was future world champion Mika Hakkinen, driving car number 11. The second car was driven by three different drivers during the season. Initially Julian Bailey was the driver, but after he failed to qualify for three out of the first four races, he was sacked by the team. Interestingly, the only race that he did qualify for was San Marino, where he finished sixth and scored one point. And that race would be the team's only points finish that season. With Bailey leaving the team, upcoming British driver and future Grand Prix winner Johnny Herbert then took over the second car. He entered 10 races with the car in total, failing to qualify once, retiring twice and finishing the remaining 7 races in really respectable positions, with a best place of 7th. However, Herbert was still competing in Formula 3000 at the time, so where his races there clashed with Formula 1, the car was driven instead by Michael Bartels. Unfortunately, Bartels failed to qualify for any of the four races that he attended. The Lotus team finished the 1991 season with three points, all of them scored at that Monaco Grand Prix. This placed them ninth out of 19 teams in the Constructors' Championship, but of course we also have to remember that a lot of those bottom end teams didn't score any points at all, or in some cases cars didn't even qualify for a single race during the whole season. The Lotus 102B was updated to the 102D for the start of the 1992 season, and in fact a 102D kit is also produced by Tamiya, or was also produced by Tamiya should I say. Now back to the build, and I said earlier that I thought this would be a fairly straightforward build, and I suppose in many ways it was. These Tamiya kits of course are well engineered, and the build sequence for their F1 cars seems to be fairly standard. So there were no big challenges there. While I was talking you'd have seen me build up the engine and the rear suspension, and a large part of the initial process for these kits is building up sub-assemblies, getting some primer down, getting some semi-gloss black down, and then doing a small amount of detail painting. That all went fine and in addition to the engine I've also built up the seat and the cockpit area. Where things started to go a bit wrong was when it came to painting the bodywork. I perhaps naively thought this would be fairly straightforward because of course it's all white, with the green sections being decals. To me I do try to help you by moulding the kit in white. For some reason, schoolboy error, I primed it in grey. But then I also made quite a big mistake with the white painting. I decided to go with the Tamiya rattle cans, this is TS26 pure white, mainly because I've got a couple of those hanging around. I used to use them a lot before I got an airbrush and I thought it's best just to use them up. Of course white is a very hard colour to get coverage with and I was a bit silly on this and I sprayed it until I could see that I was getting coverage. But of course by the time I'd done that I'd actually got way too much paint onto the piece. And you can see here, for example, I've got a big run on the left side pod there. To compound that, I also painted the entire thing at once, which meant that on the vertical surfaces, the paint ran down. And you can see at the bottom of that uh, cowling there, we've got a much thicker edge at the bottom there now where the, where the paint has run down. So a bit of a schoolboy error there on my part, a bit of impatience coming in. I should have just sprayed it very, very lightly. 
Ultimately, I had to dip these pieces into some isopropyl alcohol, IPA, use a toothbrush to scrub away the um, lacquer paint, sand everything lots, reprime everything, and repaint it. And it took me about three weeks to do the repainting process, partly because it was really cold here, I didn't want to spray the paint when it was super cold, but also because I just went with single passes each time, literally just sprayed the can, back to front, stop. Even though it looks like it only put a small amount of paint on, and just build it up slowly like that. I also made sure that the surface was horizontal when drying, so if I did just the side of the side pod, for example, I would uh, prop the piece up on its side so that that would dry flat, and hopefully the paint would do a bit more self-leveling like that. Anyway, I got there in the end, and this is how things turned out. Of course, the next job is to paint the inside black, and with all the hassle I had painting the outside, there was no way I was going to risk masking and airbrushing, so I brush painted all of the inside using Vallejo model colour. I did the same thing with the other small areas that should be black, such as the inside of the front wing end plates. Now in terms of decals, the Tamiya decals are now, what, 32 years old? Initially, if you look at the green areas, you might think they don't look too bad, but if we look at the white areas, they've clearly yellowed quite a lot. Particularly on the pure white background of the car, they're just not going to look good. I did buy an alternative set of decals, and I forget where I got these from, which company I got them from. It's one that I haven't used since because I wasn't really very pleased with them. If you look here at these solid green areas, they do seem to have been produced on, on quite a sort of a low quality inkjet printer. Um, there are definite bands in the solid green areas. There's almost a texture in fact as you touch them. And in fact, even the sharpness there of the, of the yellow wording, the, the Goodyear and so on against the green, just isn't very good. So I wasn't happy with those, put those to the side. And then I did what I should have done in the first place, which is I went to Indicals, got a set of their Lotus decals, and you can see this is night and day. These are so much better. I've used Indical decals on virtually all of my old Tamiya F1 kits, where the original decals have been knackered. And uh, as you can see, they're fantastic. They go down really, really well. One thing you do have to do with Indicals is choose which driver you want. So unlike the original sheet, they won't give you a number 11 and a number 12 car, and you could do either vehicle, um, you have to choose. But, you know, that makes sense really, doesn't it? There's no point in them printing two lots for you, it only cost you more. I went for number 12, which was the second car, driven by either Julian Bailey, Johnny Herbert, or Michael Battles. And of course, I'm going to go for the Herbert car. Although having said that, the only distinction between those is the very tiny decal with the driver's name and their national flag next to it, just sort of there in the, in the top left of the decal sheet. As with a lot of teams, especially the um, less well-funded teams during the 90s seasons, the exact sponsorship of the Lotus 102 changed throughout the season race to race. And you can see here that we've got a couple of options provided by Indical, so we've got Two options to the rear wing, one which includes that police um, sponsorship, one that doesn't. Two options for the front wing, one which includes that, um, what does that say, Swithland Motors, and one that doesn't. There were a few other variations during the season as well. There was one race at least where there's a Tic Tac logo, which isn't on these decals, but I'm not too fussed about that. We also have this image here from the Australian Grand Prix. And many thanks to Stuart on Flickr for allowing me to use this image. You can find a link to his fantastic F1 images in the description below. And this image here, taken right at the end of the season, has the BP logo there on the engine cover. We have yellow hat on the um, side pods and on the rear wing. And we have completely different sponsorship on the front wing end plates as well. 
So it really wasn't unusual for our sponsorship to change throughout the season, and to be honest, even between practice sessions and qualifying, and qualifying in the race. As far as I can tell, the Tamiya Box scheme is most similar to the British Grand Prix scheme, although we don't have the opening in the side pod, as you can see in this Australian Grand Prix version as well, supplied in the kit. I started the decal application with those for the cockpit, and it's probably a good job that I did because I forgot that with these printed IndyCal decals, the carrier film is across the entire sheet. And so you do have to cut as close as humanly possible to the actual decals to avoid that excess carrier film. That's not a problem, it's just that you've got to remember to do it, and uh, I didn't in the first couple of small decals. These large single colour area decals always make me a little bit nervous. Um, it's always quite hard I find to get them on the complex shapes of an F1 car. But to be fair, these IndyCal ones did go down really well. The size and the fit was perfect, which is something you can always say about kit decals. So they lined up on the nose here perfectly with the holes for the suspension arms. And with a bit of Tamiya Mark fit, and a bit of burnishing with a cotton bud, I did find they went down well. The tops of the side pods are also a bit tricky because, of course, you don't want any excess um, on the sides, especially the inside, because you're aware that the engine cover will be removed and that will catch on things and ultimately will damage the decal if you're not too careful. But I did manage to get it down looking fairly decent. And there's a small amount that goes over the edge onto the vertical surface. That's really just a case of having patience, applying some mark fit, gently pushing it down a bit more a bit later, and the same thing. But overall I was really happy with the fit and the way that the uh, yellow stripe here lined up. This curved nose decal was probably the hardest of all of them. There was a small amount of overlap with this and the side decal, so the green is slightly darker there where they overlap. And it was very hard to get all the wrinkles out of the nose, so even in the final version I've got a few left. But uh, overall not too bad. When the decals were all dry, I did try to give the car a gloss coat to protect them using VMS gloss varnish. I haven't had a lot of success with this recently. Uh, entirely user error, I'm sure, because it does give a really nice finish when you get it right. I feel like on top of the side pods here in particular, maybe my air pressure was a little low, and uh, it's almost like the varnish hasn't properly atomized as it's been sprayed on. So I'm hoping a combination of a second coat and some very gentle polishing, possibly sanding, will help to improve that surface. With the decals out of the way, and it did take longer than I thought, even with a relatively sponsor-free car, it was time to move on to some final touches. So the exhaust going into place. The seat can be put directly onto the floor of the car, thanks to this handy little notch. And it does make you realize just how close to the ground the drivers sit. And then it was time to remove the mould line that tends to come with Tamiya tyres. It's always best to put the wheel hubs inside the tyres first I find before sanding them. And in this case I'm using 120 grit sandpaper. For the Goodyear logos I do have some aftermarket um, decals. But I thought I'd give the original dry transfer decals a go. These are kind of strange, I never really know if I'm applying them properly but I sort of cut them out, flip them over and rub them onto the tyre surface. And once I feel like I've uh, rubbed them in there for long enough, I take a dampened cotton bud and go over the surface until that backing paper is ready to peel off. Surprisingly, despite being, what, 30 up plus years old, they did seem to go down well.
Then I had the front suspension to put together. This is always a little bit fiddly on F1 cars. The fit is very tight. I suppose it has to be really, doesn't it? Because you don't want it collapsing. But um, you do have to be very careful not to snap things and break the pins off and so on. And of course, in this case, I had to be very careful not to damage those green decals. But I got there in the end. You can see there that nose decal just isn't quite right. It's a bit wrinkly um, and not perfect there. But it was the best I could do. The cockpit fits over the under tray very well. And again, you want to use just enough to keep it on, but not so much that it seeps out the side and damages the paintwork or the decals. And then with a couple more details, the model was complete. So let's look at some final photos. Unfortunately, you will notice that the engine cover doesn't fit super well in these photos. There we go guys, that was my build of Tamiya's Lotus 102B from the 1991 F1 season, driven by Johnny Herbert. Now back in the day, Tamiya released a number of these Lotus kits. So of course the 102B, which I've uh, just built for you here. They also released the Lotus 102D, which was used at the start of the 1992 F1 season. I've actually built this kit before I had my channel, and it comes with a pre-painted figure I had the Johnny Herbert version, although for some reason I can't find the figure. But I've built the model. Tamiya also released the Lotus 107, which was used for the remainder of the 1992 season. I do have that kit, but I haven't built it yet. And then its successor, the 107B, which was used in the 1993 season. And I built this kit, but again that was before I had a YouTube channel. I also have a set of decals for this kit, which along with a couple of modifications will turn it into the 107C, which was used in the 1994 F1 season. Unfortunately, this image of the smashed up 107C driven by Pedro Lamy is the only image I could find with um, Creative Commons rights to show you. But that's how it will look when I come around to building that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I really enjoyed this build despite a few issues with the white paint. Um, definitely something for me to think about in the future. And hopefully soon I'll get a chance to show you my model room and you'll get to see some of those older models, including the F1 cars I've mentioned, that I built before my channel. Until then, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for watching. And particular thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. Thank you to all of you for your support, it really is appreciated. And until next time, have fun modelling.